Why don't we all read together? God chose the lowliest things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. Every single one of us are called by God. Do you all believe that? Every single one of us, regardless of male, female, professional, still in school, whatever, doesn't really matter who you are, every single one of us are called, a higher calling by God to love Him and to love others. What is calling? Here's a definition. A strong inner impulse toward a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by conviction of divine influence. I wanted to be pastor since I was 10 years old. Never changed. I believe God has called me to be pastor. Eventually I got married, had kids, and there was an interesting dynamic that I found between me and myself and my youngest daughter. When she was really, really young, of course, you know, it's daddy's girl. She always wanted to be my side. She got to the point where she needed to go through the stage called potty training. <clears throat> Not particularly that I'm fond of. However, this little girl insist, excuse my language, every time she goes to the bathroom and she's learning to wipe herself because she can't, as long as daddy's in the house, only one who could wipe after her is her daddy. <clears throat> only when it's mom, somebody else, only when I'm not home. But as long as I'm in her presence, from corner of my house, Appa, that's Korean and, and, and daddy. Appa, I'm done. <clears throat> you think it's all cute, huh? <laughs> it was for about a month or so. And then that carries on for second month, third month, and then it becomes like, ah, when is the slavery going to end? So one day I sat my daughter down and said, look, you now have long enough arms. You have mom. If you need, you have your siblings. You could ask, let's share. Let's share. <clears throat> of course, she said yes. But of course, she turns around. Daddy! I remember one Friday, I was reviewing my sermon, probably about love of God. Corner of my arm. Dad! Daddy! I'm done! Something switched in my head. Forget about this love of God. I was upset. <laughs> I got to put into this. <clears throat> I stomp across the room, open that bathroom door. There she was with her little throne. She's sitting there. And I start lecturing her. Why me? And I was lecturing how you could be somebody else. It's the time that she grows up. And as I was lecturing, I, it dawned on me that I've never asked her why just, why me? So I said, hey, I have two daughters so that you won't guess who's who. Hey, who told you that only daddy has to wipe your butt? The whole time she put her head down because she knew she was being lectured. But as soon as I asked that question, she lifted her head, big smile on her face, and she said, Jesus did I knew God called me to be a pastor. I knew God called me to preach, to, to, to be all things to all people. Never did I imagine that God called me to wipe my daughter's butt. 
But then it dawned on me. Yes. When it comes to a calling from God, there is no such thing as honorable position. Something you do for good or cleanness. It, has, it reaches from A to Z. Whatever God asks at a particular time, we say yes. Little, that little thing taught me about what calling is. It's not about attention. It's about being there for that person. So Moses, you all know Moses. He received a special calling, that higher calling in Exodus chapter 3. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Oh, great calling, the higher calling. A calling that we all want. Except Moses looked at himself and goes, no, uh -uh. I'm not good enough. I'm not maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but not now. Somebody once said this, God puts his greatest blessing on the other side of fear. Whenever there's a calling, we all sometimes think, I will take it. 90% of the time we go, uh-uh. I mean, you heard that I serve as a president. When I was at Loma Linda Korean Church, minding my own business, having great time, <laughs> a previous president who was executive secretary, Sandra Roberts, called me into her office and said, we would like you to be VP for Asian Pacific Ministry. I go, no. I walked out. She called me two weeks later. Have you prayed about it? I go, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't always pray for everything. <laughs> it's like, no. She goes, you should. Maybe. It eventually came to a point, because I was comfortable. I had influence. I had my little kingdom there. I don't want to go into somewhere that I don't know. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a pencil pusher. I don't want to be an administration. Same thing happened to the executive secretary. I did not have a good conversation with Sandy for one week. No, I don't want it. But somehow, when God challenges you to step into a certain position, it's not because you qualify. It's because God is saying, I will shine through you in spite of your inadequacy. So God was doing the same thing to Moses. What makes you think that you qualify? I qualify. I use you. You just got to say yes. Moses is saying, no way. Why? Because we hesitate to be great. Because when we look at ourselves on a mirror, we're not all that great. But let me redefine what greatness means. The definition of greatness is living a life of that higher calling, whatever that may be. So Paul said, one plants, one waters, God gives increase. You know what? You don't have to increase anything. If you're planting, you're great. If you're the water, you're great. Don't compare. We're great because God is great. But what gets in the way? Like Moses, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh to bring Israelites out of Egypt. For those of you who may think that Moses was humble, he was the farthest thing from being humble. Whatever struggles you have, whomever you may be, and whatever you will go through in the future, God is preparing you to do his will so that you may experience that greatness. Amen. We all don't want to fail. We don't want to be rejected. We, we feel inadequate. You know what? <clears throat> One of my favorite preachers, his name is John Orthberg. And next portion, good portion, is directly from his sermon, actually. But it really moved my heart. 
this is what he said. One of the most destructive two-word phrase is, but I. I know I have to have devotion, but I'm, t- but I'm tired. I know I should mingle with people, but I'm introverted. I love to study and get good grades, but I'm lazy. I know I should eat kale, quinoa, and tofu, but I love butter, sugar, and pizza. <laughs> but I statement keeps me from succeeding at doing what really matters. In fact, sometimes it even stops us from starting something. Whenever I say, but I. And the but I, but that but I statement actually occurs frequently in the scripture. God asked Moses to lead. He says, but I am slowed of speech. Gideon, deliver my people from Midianites, but I am the smallest of tribe. Jeremiah, be my prophet, prophesy, share my word, but I am too young. Esther, speak front of king, but I haven't been called by him for a long time. Abraham, be a father of a great nation, but I'm too old. Peter, cast your net on the other side of the boat, but I tried all night. You see this, but I, but I, but I, I can't, I can't, I won't. I struggle, God. We feel so bad because we're so inadequate. But you know what? God never say, say to you, oh, no, no, you're not inadequate. My, my, my kids, my kids, I love football. 49ers are my team, by the way, but I love football. So ever since my kids were young, I would throw football at them. Both of my kids, I have three, but uh, both of my kids are MVP of school for, for those of you who are in Orangewood Academy. Brandon Park is my son. <laughs> uh, and I noticed when my Brandon, when my son plays with boys and girls play with bo- girls, there's difference. When boys play, my son was tailback, he, you know, quarterback and so on, so he would throw the ball and drops an easy, catchable ball. You hear my son and others going, you suck. But Sydney, when my daughter plays football and she throws a football and this girl drops an easy ball, catchable ball, all the girls gather around. Oh, are you okay? Is your fingernail okay? (laughs) I kind of like my son. When you suck, you suck. (laughs) When you're inadequate, you are inadequate. God never tried to build you up falsely. He never disputes our inadequacy. You and I are inadequate and God knows. Thus, today's scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul reminds his congregation, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many of you are influential. Not many of you are noble birth. Paul goes on and on and on. Not necessary to discourage his congregation, but to put a spotlight not on them, but on Jesus Christ. Instead of discouraging them, he's actually giving them hope. Look who, are, who, look who, are we, who we are serving. But God chose the weakest, weak, weak things and weak ones and the world to shame the strong. But God chose the lowest thing of the world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify things that are so that no one may boast before him. And he goes on, keeps saying, but God, but God, but God. When, Moses, when God extend that calling to Moses and Moses says, but I can't, God is saying, you're right but I can, but God can. And you look throughout the scripture, you see the same thing over and over and over. We have this next nihilo. It's like God could create something out of nothing. Amen? 
But look from Genesis to Revelation, rarely did God create something out of nothing. Most of the time, God did something great with little things. That's where we come in. We're not nothing. We're something. We're a small thing. At least we feel like it. But when God gets involved, a small amount of oil, an empty jar, God used that. Two fishes, five loaves of bread, saliva, mud, with mud to heal the blind, old fishing net. You give God whatever you have and somehow he turns that into a great event, greatness. What do you have in your hands? You look at yourself. Oh, there's, there's probably something great about yourself, which is good. But when you're alone, there's depression. There's resentment. There's rejection. There's hurt. There is bitterness. There's low self-esteem. And what God is saying is, don't ignore that. Don't just embrace that. Give them to me. You give me that, I will do something great with that because you gave it to me. God is doing something great through you. This world tells you the following. This world might be saying, your situation is never going to change. Your lack of education should embarrass you. Lack of addiction will always enslave you. That depression that you have will defeat you. Failure will define you. Past will hunt you. Future will frighten you. And then God comes along saying, "Uh uh-uh, but I, but God. And then if you go through that scripture again, when Joseph was sold by his brothers, and then years later, he turns around, tells his brother, you intended to harm me, but God intended for good. Here's what Psalmist said. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It is Jesus who said with human beings, it is impossible, with salvation is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Are there times where you're discouraged? Are there times where you go, not possible? Fix your eyes on Jesus. And then it becomes possible. Stop excusing yourself. Stop letting yourself off the hook. Stop whining that not, things are not working out. Every time you want to, you're tempted to whine. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I know this sounds odd, but God is bigger than your butt. I tried this once with Korean church, didn't get it. But (laughs) God is bigger than your butt, right? But God said to me, "My, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. Amen. I was, I brought, uh, last minute, I asked for this. It's why, one of my favorite illustrations. When Pastor McBride comes to you, you know, When Ricky, was it Ricky, the praise team leader? When he is just up, coming closer, I was like, there better be a fence here somewhere. (laughs) It's a risk management, it's an insurance issue. (laughs) When pastor comes to you and asks you to be Sabbath school lesson leader, or to perhaps give message, or to do this, or to do that, perhaps some of you look at yourself and say, oh, pastor, I want to have this much time. When my time is, when I have enough time, I will serve. Pastor, I want to have this much money. When I have enough money, I will give. Pastor, spiritually, I'm this low. When I am full, 
when the Holy Spirit runneth over me, then I will dot, dot, dot. And somehow, for whatever reason, we have this false impression or false fact that my job is to fulfill somebody else's expectation fully. It is my job. When I am running low, there's no way I could fill this person. So when I see this jar, and it's my responsibility, uh uh-uh. What I have won't be, won't fill this cup. Therefore, I'm not even going to try. But tell me, where in the Bible has asked you, challenged you to fill this empty cup? All God asks every single one of us is whatever you have, simply empty yourself. That's all I want. That's all God wants. Empty yourself. Not to fill this empty cup, but to simply Empty yourself. I wish I could do magic, but I don't. (laughs) But the fact is, when we come to this space on every Sabbath or small group, whatever it may be, and I I I don't have enough, but instead of trying, expecting Pastor Sermon to fill me up, expecting praise team or each other, fill my cup up, instead of that attitude, I come to this space saying, whatever little I have, I'm willing to fill your cup. I'm willing to fill your cup. And by end of this worship service, as you go through fellowship, we all walk out enough to last us another week for us to empty ourselves in somebody else's shoes and you will witness miracles happen in your life, lives, and this church. Therefore, I will end with this true story <clears throat> there was about this 65 about 70 year old grandmother a Korean grandmother who lives at Korea unlike US Korea you don't need a car you could go everywhere with public transportation she loves Jesus and she will go everywhere she will go she would share gospel share this about that uh, our church and so on and she is a total soul winner her sister, uh, excuse me, her daughter lived in North Carolina. And daughter asked, Mom, can you come? Can you come and now live with me? And of course, Mom, having an opportunity to live with her daughter and, you know, grandkids, sure, I will go. And she flew over, she moved, and she thought it was going to be great. And it was for a couple of months. And then she realized she doesn't speak the language. There's no car. She can't go anywhere. And of all places, it's not LA. It's North Carolina where there are no Koreans live. Her church is an hour, hour away. It went on and she started praying, God, when I was in Korea, I will bring people to you. But here, I don't speak the language. They're not Koreans. What do I do? There's nothing I could do for you, God. So God, find me a way to be used by you. She prayed every night, not only for a week, not only for a month, for several months. And then she got this idea. Pastor, can you order me a Bible study kit in English? Pastor goes, in English? Yes, in English. So he ordered it, and she, when she went to church, she picked it up. She comes home, Sabbath afternoon, goes to her neighbor. Mrs. Smith came out. It's like, oh, hi, Mrs. Kim. All the Koreans are either Kims or Lees or Parks. Hi, Mrs. Kim, how are you? <clears throat> and this grandmother, who doesn't speak any English, she goes, um, me, no, Englishy. You, me, okay? She understood. Oh, yeah, come on in, come on in. You want me to read this so that you can learn English? Come on in. So they, you know, they take out a little English tea and all this stuff. And this lady, Miss Smith, is reading the first lesson. Creation. Number one. In the beginning. People, 
when somebody doesn't speak English, just because you talk slow, doesn't mean that they all of a sudden understand. I don't understand this slowing down. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so with great patience, she reads. And there is his grandmother. Amen. Mm -hmm. Has no idea, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you. 45 minute passes. We're done. She goes, thank you. She goes home. Following Sabbath, lesson two. Following Sabbath, lesson three. It goes on to 13 weeks. And then in the middle or toward the end of their Bible study, or so say, Mrs. Smith goes, Mrs. Kim, I would like to go to your church with you. Somehow, this grandmother understood that portion. She panicked. My church is an hour away. It's all done in Korean. What do I do? So she calls her pastor. Pastor goes, fortunately, 15 minutes from your house, there is seven American Seventh-day Adventist church. With your daughter, you could take her there. So that's exactly what she did. Miss, Mrs. Kim, the daughter, and, and Mrs. Smith, they went to that church. I'm going to fast forward four to five years. This particular church hosted a banquet in honor of Mrs. Kim. Do you know why? In span of four to five years, she led 24 souls to Christ. 24 white Caucasians. She still does not speak English. She can't. Now, what's your excuse? Is it the language? Is it your time, your finance, your spirituality? What is it? What can you say in front of this grandma saying, I cannot because it's not a matter of our inadequacy. It's not about, but I can't. It is about, but God can. This real love church, you are called by God to reflect His character. Churches, we fight. There's conflict. There's difference. But you know what? When you don't feel like your church may be the greatest church at times, fix your eyes on Jesus. Every time that you're, you're tempted to say, but I, never mind, but God can. And when you worship, when you live, with that attitude, that conviction, I could only imagine what this congregation is capable of. You can no longer say, but I can't talk to my colleagues because dot, dot, dot. But I simply say, but God, I can't, but you can. Therefore, my job is to get down on my knees and petition for this friend of mine. And when you see miracles happen, you don't need to go to somewhere, a third world country to experience miracles. You will experience it right here. And when God is evident in your lives in this church, there won't be enough pews here that's available. God has called you a higher calling by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let's bow it. Father God, you are a God that embraces us, that calls us to fulfill your mission, your desire, your heart. Father, give us that burden. Every one of us will be called to do different things, Father. And if I don't know, may you give me burden to get down on my knees 
and to long to to plead for you to reveal what you had called me to do. Father, give us courage that we need. Father, ability-wise, I may not be good enough, but you, God, you are all-powerful, all-knowing. Everywhere, therefore, I know you will be with me. I know you will be with every single one of us. So, starting from the youngest one to oldest, male, female, from lay people to pastor, may we love church continue to unite, fix their eyes on you, that the community around this church may experience who you are. May you pour out your Holy Spirit. To every single one of us. In Jesus' name, Amen.